this is my last sermon here. And believe it or not, and some of you won't believe this, but I really wanted this to be a short sermon, uh, kind of a going away present, you know. But um, the Lord woke me up this morning, and He just filled my mind up with stuff. I don't, I'm not going to be able to share all of it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to have both a short sermon and tell you everything that's on my heart. Um, we're in the middle of a series on Colossians, and I know that some of you have not been here for the previous sermons, so let me just say that we have determined, we have shown from the Bible that the book of Colossians is placed in Scripture especially for those people who will see Jesus return for the last generation, for us. And we have been looking at Colossians in a verse-by-verse -verse study. And time after time, we have seen how the words really have a greater application for that last generation. Even though the book has had meaning and application for every generation that precedes the last one, still there is a special meaning for those who will be translated without seeing death. And we're going to take up our study on uh, verse 9, Colossians 1, verse 9, this morning. But because I'm not going to be able to finish this study with you, there are just so many things I was hoping I was going to be able to share from the book of Colossians. So let me, let me just identify a little bit of what I hope you're going to find in your study when I leave. I wanted to be able to get to Colossians 3, 10 through 15. Uh, that was, and still is in my estimation, the highlight of the whole book. And I made a comment on my first Sabbath in this series that I thought somebody was going to challenge me on, but you didn't. <laughs> and I, I wanted to get to that place so that I could tie it back into what I had said on the first uh, Sabbath. And what I said was, as I was closing that first message, I said, this is the book that tells us the importance of having on the full armor, all of the armor of God. And I thought when I said that, before our, everybody leaves today, somebody's going to say, you got Ephesians mixed up with Colossians. But nobody said that to me. And uh, I guess I just slipped it by you, because I know I have some good Bible scholars here, but somehow I slipped that past you. But there is a vital connection in Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, and Colossians chapter 6, verse 16. Now, I spoke about that collection, that connection, not long after I came here in a sermon entitled, When God Doesn't Make Sense. So if you really want to look at that again. You can request that sermon, and uh, Michael back there will be glad to make a copy for you. But in that sermon, we looked at the fact that Colossians 3.14 and, Co and Ephesians 6.16, both written by Paul, both written to churches, and both saying, above all, in Colossians, above all, put on love. In Ephesians 6.16, Paul says, above all, Put on faith, the shield of faith. Now, how do you have two things that are both above all? Doesn't seem possible, does it? But if you'll remember, we found that love is the ultimate faith test. And so those two texts do not fight with each other, but they support each other and they open up a connection between Ephesians and Colossians. It's almost as though Colossians has a great black hole, like scientists talk about being in space, and everything that gets near it gets sucked into that hole. Colossians 3.14 is like that. It's not the only place in Colossians that is like that, and you'll find some others. But I wanted to identify for you that that is one of those places that pulls other things in. And what Colossians 3.14 pulls into the letter that was written to the church at Colossae is this idea of the armor of God. And you'll find a parallel in 
Colossians 3, beginning with verse 10 through 15, you will find a a very direct, easy to identify parallel between that and the armor of God found in Ephesians 6. Not only does it pull in that parallel, it pulls in practically everything John wrote. 1 John 1, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, much of the Gospel of John is all pulled into this concept, above all, put on love. Romans chapter 8 is pulled in, where we see the confidence that we can have in our relationship with Jesus Christ and His power to sustain us, to direct us, to take us from wherever He finds us all of the way to His kingdom. Isaiah 58 is pulled in. Much of the Bible, actually, by extension, gets pulled into this hole in Colossians 3.14. Now, If that's true, and much of the Bible gets pulled in there, then how can I say that this book is for those who will see Jesus when he comes? When I've just told you that it includes the whole Bible. But catch this, and then we're going to go to the sermon for today. This is what the Lord woke me up, and he said, Chuck, you've got to tell them this before you leave. (laughs) You see, all down through history, Colossians has existed within the framework of Scripture. But for the last generation, we are being shown that all of Scripture exists in the framework of Colossians. And the things that we're studying in Colossians give structure and meaning and substance to the rest of the Bible and how it relates to the people who will see him return in the clouds. Let us pray. Father, as we look into your word, we recognize our tremendous need of your guidance. We invite your presence here to not only be in this room, but to come into our minds, open our understanding, give us a clear perception so that we can be fashioned to fit your hand, to fit the place that you have made for us in your kingdom, and so that we can be sharpened to accomplish your mission on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of weeks ago, we finished with verse 8, Colossians 1 and verse 8, talking about Epaphras. How many of you remember what Epaphras means? Patty remembers because she's heard this sermon more than once now. (laughs) Anybody besides besides Patty, do you remember what Epaphras means? Oh, good. I should review this then. Uh, It not only is the name of a person. I see heads going up and down. Does that mean you did remember but you were bashful? You're bashful. Okay, we'll forgive you for being bashful, and it's your fault that I'm reviewing this. (laughs) It not only is the name of a person, it is a word. In Greek, it is a word, and it means a Christian. A Christian. Every one of us should be Epaphras. And we are told that these new converts heard the gospel from a Christian from Epaphras. And we learned that that meant that we all needed to be involved in sharing. We not only are sheep, but we are shepherds. And we all have a flock. You remember two weeks ago I told you that I'm a sheep and my shepherd is the ministerial director for the Gulf States Conference, Don Shelton. I am one of his sheep. We all have sheep and we all are sheep. We need to be involved in the mentoring process. We need to be involved in communicating the gospel to others. As a matter of fact, you cannot be a true sheep unless you're willing to be a shepherd. If you're not willing to be a sheep, who else is in the flock? What does the Bible tell us is in that flock besides sheep? Wolves. If you're not willing to be a shepherd, you cannot be a true sheep, which makes you a wolf. And the wolves 
get thrown into the lake of fire. Just clue you in here. You don't want to be a wolf. You want to be a sheep and you want to be a shepherd. So Epaphras not only took the gospel to the pagans of his day and taught them the hope that we all share, the blessed hope that Jesus made possible. He not only taught them that, but he came back to the established church and he talked about them. You remember that? He talked about them, the ones that he had converted. You remember what he had to say? In verse 8, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. He declared their love. What's up with that? Couldn't he think of anything bad to say about these people? I mean, they were fresh out of paganism. New converts barely in the family. Like Torger, barely in the family. Don't they make mistakes? Isn't there anything wrong with these people? Couldn't he find anything bad to say? Well, you remember, we talked about this. And what's really being shown here is a picture of a healthy family. A healthy Christian church family. Where we lift people up and we don't tear people down. Where we talk about the good things. And I think I pointed out to you that in the two years, actually it's going to be two years, next week would be two years. So I'm not quite going to make two years. But in the two years, forgive me for stretching, that I've been here, I've talked about my sister on a number of occasions. I've used her as an illustration in sermons. But have you ever heard me say anything derogatory about my sister? Did I ever tell you the bad stuff? She wasn't perfect. She wasn't a saint. I could tell you some bad things. But that's not what family does. We lift each other up. And that's what Epaphras. What does Epaphras mean? That's what a Christian did in Paul's day. And that's what he's writing about. Now, I had to go through that little bit of review because how does verse 9 begin? For this reason... So if, when it says, for this reason, I'm reading from the New King James Version, for this reason refers us back to what we just read in verse 8. Because they were a close Christian family. Because Epaphras had nothing bad to say. Because the home church trusted that they were growing into the body of Christ because of all of that. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Notice that fellow Christians have a desire that their brothers and sisters in the family be filled with his wisdom and all knowledge. There's no jealousy. There's no wishing that we knew more. Do you see that? They want the brand new Christians to know as much as they know, to know everything there is to know, to be as close to the throne as they could possibly be. There's no jealousy. I want you to look back at Isaiah 58 just for a moment. In Isaiah 58 and verse 4. Now Ellen White says, and I don't quote Ellen White to you very much. I mean, I I keep my sermons out out of the Bible. But she is one of my favorite authors. And she says that this chapter, Isaiah 58, is for us. She says that Seventh-day Adventists need to understand every word of Isaiah 58 as though their lives depend upon it. Now, that's not an exact quote, but that's the essence of what she says. This chapter is for us. And in verse 4, it says, Indeed, you fast for strife and debate, and to strike with the fist of wickedness. 
You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Make your voice heard on high. That's a reference to an activity that we call prayer, right? Prayer. And what did we just read here in Colossians 1 verse 9? We do not cease to pray for you. So in both verses, we're talking about prayer, talking about contact with our Heavenly Father. But in one case, we're talking about people who want to be able to excel in debate. They want to be able to come to Sabbath school and show off their spiritual knowledge and let everybody know that they're just a little bit closer to the throne than anybody else. Now, that's not, that's not healthy. That's not a family. That's conflict. But what we're being shown here in Colossians is that the people who are ready for translation, the people who are preparing to see Jesus coming in the clouds will be people who don't compete with each other, who want everyone to be the best. They want everybody else to be closer, if possible, even than they are, because their concern is for the other. Is, isn't that the definition of love? Putting the interests of others above ourself. The people who will be translated without seeing death will be people who have that desire for their fellow church member and for those who are going to be church members from the community. We talked about that two weeks ago. That it, let me just say it briefly. Do you read the heart? Do you know who's right with God and who's not? Do you know which Baptist, which Catholic, which Methodist, which Presbyterian, which agnostic, which atheist is responding to the call of the Holy Spirit upon his heart to grow closer to the throne of grace? Do you know that? So if you cannot draw that line, how many people do you need to treat like brothers and sisters? Yeah, it's not the people in this room. There are... I mean, I wish I didn't have to say this, but the fact is there are probably people in this room who are not responding to the Holy Spirit. And there are people outside of this room who are responding. And you and I don't know who they are. And so it is incumbent upon us to treat everyone as a brother, as a sister, to seek the well-being of those around us. And Jesus said, even if they prove to be your enemy, do what? Love them too. In verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Is that awesome? Now, I do not, I'm going to say some things here that could be misconstrued. I don't want you to think that I'm talking about salvation by works. I don't want you to think that sanctification gets you to heaven. I don't want you to think that the power of the Holy Spirit on display in your life that changes you from what you used to be to what you will be, I don't want you to think in any way that that paves the way for you to get to heaven. But we are being shown some things here about the power of God and what it can accomplish in the life that is submitted to it. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully Pleasing Him. I, language fails me. I mean, ministers or pastors are supposed to be wordsmiths. You know, we're supposed to have some language skills. I, I don't have it. I don't have words for what I just read. Fully pleasing Him? Incredible. Is God's word with power an incredible promise that's made to us? The Holy Spirit can come into your life. He can transform you. It's going to get better. Listen. Being fruitful in every good work. 
and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, if you are increasing in the knowledge of God, is there ever going to come a time when you're ready to look at everybody else and say, I'm there. Hey, I made it. (laughs) I hope you all can get up here where I'm at. Is that ever going to happen? No. Because no matter how much you learn about him, and no matter how much you learn from him, what does it do? It creates a greater appetite and a deeper understanding of what you still lack. There's a thing called an inverse ratio, and I talked about this in a sermon. I can't remember the title of that sermon, but we, we did talk about it once before, but this is such a perfect place to put it. I've got to, I've got to remind you of it. An inverse ratio. Now, I know I don't have to explain this to Ken because he's a mathematician, but an inverse ratio is when you have two numbers, and when one gets larger, the other gets smaller, and they do it in exact proportion to each other. It could be expressed by two glasses, one full of water, one empty. And as I pour the water from the full glass to the empty one, the relationship between the levels of the water would be an inverse ratio. As one gets fuller, the other gets emptier, and so forth. That's exactly what happens in the life of a Christian. An inverse ratio occurs which causes what we call, what is referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. And it protects us from pride. It protects us from ever coming to that point where we say, boy, I hope the rest of you can get to be as good as me. In the life of a true Christian, that point would never be reached because of the inverse ratio. Let me illustrate it this way. If you walk up to a man, just an average person on the street who doesn't appear to be a Christian, sometimes you can kind of tell by the way they dress and act and talk. And So you walk up to somebody like that and you say, what do you think? I'm taking a survey today. What do you think about Jesus? What's your opinion of Jesus? And that person might respond to you by saying, well, uh, as far as I know, Jesus was a pretty good guy. A lot like me. I mean, Jesus didn't rob banks, and I don't rob banks. Jesus didn't kill people, and I don't kill people. Jesus didn't lie, and I don't lie very much. So Jesus and I were just a whole lot alike. But then suppose that next week that person was in an evangelistic series and the Holy Spirit was there and he gave his heart to the Lord. He was born again. And five years later you met him on the streets again and you walked up to him and you said, Sir, I'm doing a survey. Um... What do you think about Jesus? If he really did give his heart to the Lord, if he's really been growing in the family of God, he's likely to respond to you something like this. Oh, Jesus, I wish I could be like him. He is so wonderful. He's so wise. He's so powerful. He's so good. I just wish I could be like him. Well, the fact is, that for the last five years, he's been growing more and more like him every day. He is much closer to being like Jesus now than he was five years ago. But not only has his life changed, but his spiritual perceptions have changed. So even though he is more like Jesus than he's ever been in his life, he feels less worthy of being told that he's like Jesus. He feels less worthy. And that creates what we call the time of Jacob's trouble. Just before Jesus comes, the redeemed, ready to be translated without seeing death, the people being spoken of in Colossians, will be more like Jesus than they've ever been. But they will feel less worthy of his kingdom. And there will be no pride. Pride is the foundation of Lucifer's kingdom. Humility is the foundation of God's kingdom. And that inverse ratio at work in our lives protects us from ourselves, protects us from our pride, 
protects us from judgmentalism. It protects us from Pharisaism. It keeps us humble, and it keeps us in tune with his will for our lives. Verse 11, strengthened with all might. Strengthened with all might. Let's see. Who can I use here? Ken, you got good reflexes? Not anymore. (laughs) Stand up here just for a second. Now, now don't hit me, okay? But I'm going to hit you in the nose. Unless you stop me, you're going to get decked. So let your reflexes work now because you're about to get it. (laughs) He stopped me. Did you see that? All might. Are we in a battle? Is there a war going on? When we're under attack, wouldn't you like to know that you had all might? Listen to this verse. Listen to what it says. We're not talking about the might of Ken Shaw or Chuck Woods. Listen to it. Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. According to His power. Let me ask you something. Lucifer has attacked the human family. And with only one exception, he has defeated us. He has flattened us. Every one of us. Who was the exception? Jesus. Jesus was never beaten by Lucifer. They fought many rounds. (laughs) And Jesus won every single time. Do you realize that we have been offered His power, His might? I'm going to give you one quick illustration I think I gave you once before, but it just, it just helps to solidify this in our minds. Imagine for a moment that it's midnight and you haven't gone to bed yet and you're hungry, and there's a half a gallon of butter pecan ice cream in the freezer. Now, I am not telling you that butter pecan ice cream is a sin. I had some yesterday. But at midnight, most of us know enough about health principles to realize that it would be wrong for you to put something like that in your system. And so the devil has brought his attack. Now, in in place of butter pecan ice cream, you can substitute whatever your greatest weakness is. And we all have it. We all have something that he bugs us with constantly. So just substitute that. But I'm going to keep talking about butter pecan ice cream because that's one of my failings. And so you realize you're under attack and you you just grit your teeth and you stiffen your spine and you flex your muscles and you say, I'm not going to do it. I'm not. And you go to bed and you don't eat any butter pecan ice cream. You drink a glass of water like a good boy or girl and you go to bed. And the next morning you wake up and you are so happy with yourself. Because you can beat the devil. You saw it. Now, the fact is, you were never tempted by the devil to eat butter pecan ice cream. You were tempted by the devil to believe that you could beat him. And he won. The point is, he will always win. I think I used this illustration with somebody just last week. I don't remember if they're here or not. But anyway, if we can have, and they, uh, they tell us that we have a potential of having an IQ of 200. If that's true, then Lucifer has an IQ of 10,000. He has 6,000 years of experience with temptation, and we don't know how long he lived before that 6,000 years began. You will not beat the devil, ever. When you think you beat him, that's when you got licked the hardest, because he would like for you to believe that you have some spiritual power in and of yourself. He would love it if you thought that. You will never beat him. 
the power that is available to us does not come from us. It's not because we're morally pure. It's not because we have a great willpower. It's not because of some human characteristic that we inherited with our genes. It has nothing to do with you. There's only been one member of the human race who ever beat him. And that was Jesus Christ. And there's only one right way to respond to temptation. When the temptation comes, you need to acknowledge that you are under attack. And you need to turn to the one who knows how to deal with that attack. And you need to welcome him onto the battlefield of your mind. This is where all battles are fought, right between our ears. And I like to visualize it. When, when Lucifer brings the attack, he's right in my face. Isn't that the way he does it? He's not off in the distance somewhere saying, oh, wouldn't you like? No, he gets right in your face and he's sure of victory. And so I like to visualize my Lord coming to my rescue on a white horse. And the second that first hoof touches the battlefield of my mind, the devil turns and runs for all he's worth. Because he knows he cannot beat Jesus. And as long as I turn it over to him, as long as I let Jesus fight the battle, I will never be tempted to be proud. I will never be tempted to think that I have some special essence within me that resists evil. It must be Jesus' battle. And I have available to me if I will trust in it, all power, all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy. Does that not sound to you like a description of people who are ready to be translated? Doesn't that sound like a description of that group of people? Look at verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Qualified us. Now remember, I told you, I'm not talking about you earning your salvation. It is a free gift. God has paid for it. But those were not my words that I just read. That came straight off the pages of the Bible. The apostle to the Gentiles wrote that. And he wrote it to Gentile Christians. By the way, do we have any Gentile Christians here today? He just said that the power of God could qualify me for life in his kingdom. Isn't that what I just read? The promise is that we can live now as though we're already there. That's what I just read. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. I told you that this got sucked into that black hole in Corinthians 3.14. I'm going to show you a little bit of that black hole and what got sucked into it. 1 John chapter 4. This is not in my notes, by the way, and this will make my sermon a little bit longer. Verse 17, 1 John 4, 17. Love has been perfected among us. Love has been what? Perfected among us. Well, of course it was. It was perfected among us in the life of Jesus Christ, right? That's the way this verse will finish. It was perfected among us in the life of Jesus Christ. No, that's not what this verse says. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, present tense, as He is, so are we in this world. You can forget about waiting till you get a glorified body to give up butter pecan ice cream. He's saying right now, in this world, 
The power is available for us to be like he is. And that's what we just read in Colossians. He has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us, past tense, from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Past tense. He has conveyed us all of the Bible for the last generation of people, the ones who will see Jesus when He comes. All of Scripture should fit into the framework of this letter. This letter that was given especially for us. Conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. The remnant are ready to be translated because they already live there. Surrounded by darkness. Attacked daily. They already live there. In our Sabbath school lesson, we had that text. I write these things unto you that you sin not. But if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I am not telling you that this experience that's being described here is a part of your salvation. I'm not telling you that. Your salvation is free. It's a gift. Jesus paid for it. He lived the life that you need in judgment. And his life will be what stands for you in judgment. Your life will not stand. So I don't want to be misunderstood here. We're only talking about the power of God on display in a human life and what is possible for you. And those people who are translated without seeing death will be people who have allowed the Holy Spirit to accomplish this in their lives. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You see, Paul understood the danger too. It makes me nervous to talk to you like this. And I'm sure it made Paul nervous. He didn't want anybody to get the idea that this transformation, this new life, this citizenship in the kingdom of light, even though we're in the midst of darkness, he didn't want anyone to misunderstand him. And I hope no one misunderstands me today. And so he made it clear. In whom, Jesus is the one, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And then we're going to close with this concept. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible, Invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before, that word translated from the Greek word pro, before. It has two possible meanings. Either of them will suffice, but I'm going to give you both of them. It can mean above in importance. Jesus is above everything in creation, in importance. Everything in the universe, visible or invisible. What we're being told clearly here is that Jesus is an equal part of the triune Godhead. The name for the Godhead is Yahweh. And it applies equally to all three parts. Jesus has just as much claim to the name Yahweh as does God the Father or God the Spirit. He is the active agency of creation. He is all of the Godhead bodily, is the way the Bible puts it. All of the Godhead bodily. He is before. The other way you can understand pro is coming first in time. Coming first in time. So if you don't like the use of 
above everything, let's just take the other meaning. Coming first in time. That means that before Jesus, there was what? Nothing. Nothing. If there's nothing before him, then who is the source of all life? From whom does all creation spring? From whom does all power flow? From whom does all knowledge come? Everything originates with Jesus. Now when I say that, I'm not trying to leave the Holy Spirit and the Father out. And I'm also not telling you that I understand the Trinity. But the Bible is clearly telling us that Jesus is just as much a part of that Godhead as any other part of it. And Arianism has no place in our theology. The idea that Jesus was somehow created for our salvation is not biblical. It finishes by saying, all things, he is before all things, and in him all things consist. All things are held together. Do you know that scientists really cannot explain why you hold together? Now, you can talk about the mutual attraction of matter for matter, but let's take, for instance, my fingernail. If the mutual attraction of matter for matter explains the existence of my fingernail, then my fingernail would be a more or less spherical glob. But it's not, is it? It's on a flat plane. It's held in a particular shape. What holds it? What keeps it in that shape? We just read it. Jesus is the reason all things consist. All things hold together. He is involved in your next heartbeat. He's involved in all of our tomorrows. He is the power that put us here. He is the power that sustains us here. He is the power that directs us here. If we're looking anywhere else, we're in trouble. We are in trouble. But the good news is that Jesus is plain to see. And you don't have to look anywhere else because there is a light in the world. And the light shines upon the path of your life and mine. And it leads us all the way from wherever it finds us to his kingdom. And that's the good news of the gospel. I'm not telling you that you have to be sinlessly perfect to be in his kingdom. I'm not telling you that. But this book does make it plain that his power is available. And when it said, my little children, I write these things unto you that you sin not. It was giving us a very real expectation. A very real expectation. And if we fail, he's still our advocate. He still loves us. He still doesn't throw us away. He's still going to take us home. But you parents, tell me something. When you're thinking about your hopes, your dreams for your children, what do you want? For your kids. Don't you want the very best? You see, that's exactly what God wants for us. And he's made it possible for each and every one of us. He's done everything necessary for us to have the very best now and forever. And we can trust him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you because you are a God who cares. You do still love us. You're actively involved in guiding our lives. As we indicated earlier, we're very thankful for the new life that you've sent into our congregation. 
And we know that you will answer our prayer and you will guide and you will direct and you will make Torger's life a, a beacon of light and truth. We trust that it's not going to have to be a beacon for very long because your coming must be near. And until that day, we want to join Torger in being that beacon. We want to be the lighthouse that you intended us to be as your word is lived out in each of us by your power and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.